I'm a tech geek originally, I became a policy geek, and I'm going to start obvious and boring. Uh, private companies are self-interested. They act on behalf of their shareholders, and they have a responsibility to put profits ahead of the public interest. Senator Franken covered that. Uh, a recent post uh, on The Economist magazine's technology blog picks up from there, quoting, why exactly does America have regulators? Regulators, in theory, are more expert than politicians and less passionate. They're imperfect. But that we have any regulators at all is a testament to the idea that companies left to their own devices don't always act in the best interests of the market. And they go on to say, if companies always agreed with regulators' rules, there would be no need for regulators. The very point of a regulator is to do things that companies don't like out of concern for the welfare of the market or the consumer. <laughs> Fans of British uh, periodicals in the house, I guess. <laughs> uh, when we talk about broadband, there's a definite gap between what's best for communities and what's best for the private companies. Next generation networks are very expensive and they take many years to break even. With that preface, I challenge the FCC to start regulating in the public interest. The FCC does not need a consensus from big companies on network neutrality. It needs to respect the consensus of Americans that we do not want our access to the internet to look like our access to cable television. <laughs> I love this crowd. While, while network neutrality is, necess is necessary, though, it's not sufficient. The entire issue of network neutrality arises out of the failed deregulation approach of the past decade. Such policies have allowed a few private companies to dominate broadband access, giving communities neither competition, neither or, or a choice, or, I'm sorry, or an influence in the networks on which they depend. That's why the FCC must ensure all communities have the right to build their own, to build their own networks. Outside of DC, believe it or not, community networks aren't a partisan issue. Last week, Opelika, Alabama, voted by a 62% margin to build one. The city council president noted, as a council, we have never been more unified on a single matter than we have been on this. One of the most conservative cities in America, which is Lafayette, Louisiana, operates the absolute best broadband network in the US as measured by value. I have to pay, uh, I'm sorry. For less than $30 a month, anyone can get a 10 megabit per second symmetrical connection. As a tech geek, I love that. In St. Paul, I have to pay three times as much to get an upload that's anywhere close to that. Lafayette is not isolated. The single fastest network available to, on a citywide basis, the fastest tier of service, is 150 megabits per second. It's served up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, by the city. They just recently announced it. Long before Verizon was building these networks, Bristol, Virginia built a fiber to the home network for its very rural community, attracting new investment and hundreds of high paying jobs. Here in Minnesota, Monticello is unique, being the only community in the country with two citywide fiber to the home networks that are competing head to head. The incumbent, <laughs> believe it or not, the incumbent phone company suggested that DSL was sufficient for what they needed. And when Monticello moved ahead with their network, they found themselves in court while the incumbent built out its network to compete. Monticello won the lawsuit, but it lost a year. Nonetheless, Monticello now has the best broadband deals in the entire Midwest. In Utah, the Utopia network offers more than 10 service providers to every subscriber. This is a real choice between service providers who are offering some of the fastest speeds of the country at very affordable rates. And, but they have struggled financially, it's important to note. And that's in part due to a constant attacks from massive incumbent companies and crippling laws passed by the state legislature, which seems to be controlled by telco and cable lob lobbyists. 18 states now have barriers to discourage community networks, and that includes Minnesota. Cook County, our most rural county, way up northeast of Duluth, it relies on a single fiber line from Quest for all of its connectivity. And they've begged for years to have a redundant connection to have some greater reliability. This past January, a single accident left them without telecom services for 12 hours. 
No business could process credit cards. 9-11 did not work. U.S. border security had to use Canadian communications. ATM ceased to function, and police officers could not run plates. 12 hours. And it wasn't just Cook, it was also Lake, but Cook did a real good job of publicizing it. <laughs> the previous November, a majority of their citizens had actually approved building a fiber-to-the-home network that would also create middle-mile redundancy, solving problems like that. They even agreed to a small tax on themselves to help pay for it. But Minnesota law requires a supermajority of 65% for a community to build this kind of a network. That's 5% more than the impossible 60% majority in the U.S. Senate. <laughs> Such a restrictive law is great for incumbent companies who are protected from competition. Offering a single fiber line to Cook is a very profitable decision for Quest shareholders. It's a disastrous uh, decision for the community. And this is why the FCC needs to stand up for all of us. States must not be allowed to cripple communities, forcing them to watch history pass them by. We demand both network neutrality and the right to own our own networks when we choose. The FCC has authority on these issues, and it must start to use it. Thank you.